All right, so the, basically uh, we're gonna do hypothesis again today. And this, so I'm gonna tell you a story. The story I'm gonna tell you is almost identical to the story that I told you last class, but there's a small differences. So every day that I teach hypothesis, I'm gonna tell you some kind of story at the beginning so that you can understand what the point of a hypothesis is. But every story is gonna be slightly different. Every section, the king and peasant are fighting over something slightly different. So last class, the king and peasant were fighting over mu, which was an average of um, numbers in a big bag. And today the king and peasant are gonna fight over a percentage instead of an average. Okay, so let's see what changes. So let's see, what does it say? Hypothesis for a population proportion. All right, so here's the story. So there's this big bag of numbers. So last class I told you we have this huge bag of numbers. We call this population data. It's an imaginary bag of numbers. It's numbers if you collect data from a big group of people. Don't forget that every stats problem is about a big group of people called the population. And if you collect data from the entire population, all your answers, all the data is in this bag. But in a stats class, you don't collect data from the entire population. So this is an imaginary bag of answers is what it is. It's a huge bag of numbers that we wish we had, but we don't. Last class, we were trying to figure out an average. So like, let's say I wanna know the average age of all Rio Hano students. So imagine I talk to every single Rio Hano student. So it's like 20,000 people. And I ask each one of them for their age and I put their answer in this bag. Okay, so this bag is filled with the ages of all Rio Hano students. And then mu would be the average of all those numbers. And that's what I'm dying to know. But um, the deal is I'm not gonna to talk to all Rio Hano students. So I'm not gonna collect this data. So I don't have the data, so I can't figure out mu. So we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with, well, what do we do? We wanna know mu, what do we do? Uh, so that's the idea. But today we're talking about percentage problems. So this time the question is, we still have a question about a big group, but it's a yes or no question. Like for example, let's say I wanna know the percentage of all real Hana students that are married. Okay. So if I wanted to know, so that would be P, percentage of all real Hana students that are married. So what I would have to do is talk to every single Rio Hano student and ask them one at a time if they're married and they would give me a yes or no answer. If I talk to all 20,000 Rio Hano students and ask them that, and I put all their answers in a bag, that's what this bag is today. Population data, it's the data. If I collected the data from the entire big group, but the, today, unlike last class, this bag doesn't have numbers in it. This bag has yeses and nos in it. Or you can think of them as ones and zeros. If you wanna think about numbers, it's ones and zeros. So this bag only has ones and zeros in it, or you can think of it as yeses and nos, but it's an imaginary bag because I didn't actually collect the data. So we got this huge bag of yeses and nos. I wish I had all the data, but I don't. P is the percentage of yeses in this bag or the percentage of ones in this bag. It's like the percentage of all Rio Hano students that are married. I'm dying to know what this P is, but I don't know it because I don't have the data. So we're freaking out, okay? I wanna know what P is. What is this number P? And then we get the king, the king comes along and says, relax, I know what it is. And he says, P is 35%. So he's saying the percentage of yeses in this bag is 35%, or the percentage of ones in the bag is 35%. Or you could think of it as the percentage of all real Hana students that are married is 35%. So we love the king. He's an honest king. He's never lied to us before. And so we're happy. We're like, okay, King's telling me it's 35%. That's it, it's 35%. We believe him and story's over and everybody's happy. Everybody's happy except for one person called the peasant. The peasant says, no, 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 the King is wrong. The percentage of yeses in this bag is not 35%. He says it's less. No, 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 I think P is less than 35%. Okay, if we had this data, we could calculate P and see, is it equal to 35%? If it is, we believe the king. Is it less than 35%? Then we believe the peasants. But we don't have the data, so we can't calculate P. So what do we do? There's an argument here. The king and peasant are not agreeing on what P is, and so we're gonna decide who to believe. Now remember, we love the king, he's an honest king, so we're gonna give the king every benefit of the doubt. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we wanna tell the peasant, go away. The king says 35%, we believe him, story's over. The peasant's like, guys, listen to me. The king is wrong this time. It's less than 35%. And he won't go away. He insists it's less than 35%. So we have to decide who to believe. The way we're gonna decide who to believe is we're gonna gather evidence. 
what we're going to do is we're going to take a sample. That means we're going to take some data out of this bag. That means some yeses and nos, not all the yeses and nos, just some of them. And we're going to calculate the percentage of yeses in our sample, which is called p hat. That's always what you do in a stats class. What's the first step? Take a sample. So we take a sample and calculate p hat. For example, I could go to Rio Hondo and talk to 200 students and ask them if they're married. Instead of talking to 20,000 students, I just talk to 200. That would be my, the, I'd, have a, I'd have 200 yeses and no answers, and then I can calculate the percentage of yeses in my sample. Like I can calculate the percentage of those 200 Rio Hondo students that are married. Okay, so we're calculating p hat. They're not arguing over p hat, they're arguing over p, but I cannot figure out what p is because I don't have all the data to calculate it. The best thing I could do is get some data, sample, and calculate p hat. And based on my p hat answer, I'm gonna look at this answer, and from that answer, I'm gonna decide who to believe. Is this evidence in favor of the king or is this evidence in favor of the peasant? Okay, so to decide who to believe, you take a sample and you calculate p hat. And based on your p hat answer, you decide who to believe. Now, the king is saying that p is 35%. Remember that p hat is your best one number guess for p. So p hat should be close to p. This number should be close to whatever the king is saying. So if the king is right that p is 35%, this number for p hat that you get, it doesn't have to be 35%, but what it needs to be is it needs to be close to 35%. And when I say close, it could be less or greater or equal. So as long as it's close, we believe the king. So that's the idea. We're going to calculate the p hat, and basically we're checking to see is it close to the number the king is saying or not? Okay, that's the idea. So if you take a sample, calculate p hat, and you get exactly 35%, someone tell me who do you believe? The king? You believe the king, that's right. Yeah, because the king is saying 35% for p, and we're calculating p hat, and I'm wondering if I'm getting something close. I'm getting something, I'm getting exactly 35%, so we definitely believe the king. If p hat is greater than 35%, in this situation, I don't even care if it's close to 35% because the peasant is saying less than, but we're getting a greater than. That is not evidence in favor of the peasants, not evidence at all in favor of the peasant. So we automatically go with the king in that situation there. Okay, if p hat is less than 35%, this is the most interesting situation. Actually, almost every hypothesis you do will be this situation and not the first two, because the first two are too obvious. You don't have to do all the work we do, okay? You just say, oh, it's 35%, believe the king. Bigger than 35%, believe the king, no question. But what if PI is less than 35%, who do you believe? The answer is, it depends. That's the tricky one. People get tricked there because people see less than and they go, oh, peasant saying less than, let's believe the peasant. No, you don't automatically believe the peasant. Let me say it again. If the king is right that p is 35%, p hat should be close to 35%, but it could be close and be less, and the king can still be right. So if you get a 30, less than 35%, the king could still be right. And remember, we want to give the king every benefit of the doubt. So if it's close, we're still going to believe the king. So if p hat is less than 35%, but it's close to 35%, we're still believing the king. Think of it like this. Think of it as if p hat is less than 35%, Okay, that's a little bit of evidence in favor of the peasant because the peasant is saying less than, but it's also close to 35%. And because it's close, that's some evidence in favor of the king. And if we don't have overwhelming evidence in favor of the peasant, then we're siding with the king. So we believe the king in this situation. But if p hat is less than 35% and far from 35%, that's the situation where we believe the peasants. Again, think of it like this. The fact that we're getting a less than is some evidence in favor of the peasant. The fact that it's far from 35% is more evidence in favor of the peasant. So now we have super strong evidence in favor of the peasant. So we believe the peasant. Okay, so that's the story for the hypothesis test that we're gonna do today. Again, it's very similar to the one I taught you last time. Just the difference is there's a huge bag of yeses and nos instead of just numbers. And P is the percentage of yeses in this bag and they're fighting over it. So you take a sample and calculate p hat to decide who to believe, whereas last class you took a sample and calculated x bar to decide who to believe. So they're fighting over a different letter today. They're fighting over p, a percentage, instead of mu, an average. All right, so uh, let me just add a couple little things to this story and then we'll move on. Um, things I've told you before, but I'll say it again. The, the king's claim will always have an equal sign. Okay, so always. King's claim always has an equal sign. 
the peasant's claim will never have an equal sign. Here I have the peasant saying P is less than 35%. That's one thing he could say. Or the peasant can say P is greater than 35%. Or the peasant can say P is not equal to 35%. So the, the peasant has three options for what he can claim. So the one that it, the claim that he's making, you have to, you'll figure it out by reading the problem. So read the problem super carefully, and then you can figure out which one of these claims is, uh, he's making. Uh, okay, uh, the next thing I wanna tell you is again, think of it like a trial, okay? This hypothesis stuff is all about like putting the king on trial, okay? You know, whenever there's a trial, um, the person is innocent until proven guilty. So what that really means is the, you know, they have to gather evidence. In this case, our evidence is P hat, but they gather evidence. And if they're, you, there's always a presumption of innocence. You always assume the king is telling the truth. The king is innocent unless there's overwhelming evidence in favor uh, against the king. If there's overwhelming evidence in, against the king, then you send the, him to jail. But if there's just a little bit of evidence against the king, but not that much, then you say, no, 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 we'll just say not guilty. Okay? So that's the idea. So we have to have overwhelming evidence against the king to believe the peasant. Otherwise, we believe the king. So I'm going to give you some formulas. The quantity we're performing a hypothesis test about. What is the letter that the king and peasant are fighting over today? Last class, the king and peasant were fighting over mu. What letter are they fighting over today? Someone tell me. Percentage, P? P, that's right, percentage, P. They're, they're fighting over a percentage, right? Okay, the significance level, just like I told you last time, is alpha. That's the area of the rejection region. So area rejection region, significance level, alpha, they all stand for the same thing. So alpha is the total area of the rejection region. Now, most problems, an alpha will be given to you. And once in a while, an alpha will not be given to you. So we have to learn how to do problems when alpha is not given to you. We're going to talk about it a little bit today. But when alpha is given to you, they're giving you the area of the rejection region. And the usefulness for that is it helps you determine where the cutoff line is for the rejection region. So you find the cutoff line where you stop believing the king and you start believing the peasant. Okay, the probability distribution we're going to use today is the Z distribution. It mirrors the stuff we did in chapter nine. In chapter nine, when we built a confidence interval for mu, we use the T table. And in chapter 10, when you do a hypothesis test for mu, same thing, it's the T table. But in chapter nine, when we built confidence intervals for a percentage, we use the Z table. Okay. So same thing here, when we're doing a hypothesis test for P, we use the Z table. So anytime it's a percentage problem, use the Z table. Anytime it's an average problem, like the ones we talked about last class, use the T table. Because we're using the Z table, I don't need a degrees of freedom formula because the Z table is the only one that doesn't need degrees of freedom. So we can go on to the test statistic formula. All right, the test statistic formula lets you know how far apart the two numbers are. What are the numbers that we're trying to figure out how far apart they are. Well, the king has a claim for P. In the last slide, it was P is 35%. And to decide who to believe, you take a sample and you calculate P hat. And I want to know is P hat close to P? Is my P hat, my sample percentage, close to the king's claim of what P is? So I want to know, are these numbers close? Okay. And if they're close together, then we believe the king. If they're far apart, we believe the peasant. So we have a formula that helps me figure out how close or how far apart they are. And what I told you before was it was the Z transformation formula. So here's the Z transformation formula. This is not the formula we used last time. What we did was we took this formula and we adjusted it to the situation we were in, in section 10.3. Now in section 10.2, we're gonna do that again. So we're gonna adjust this formula to the situation we're in today. I don't need these two things to appear on top. I need these two things to appear on top. The top two, th this formula helps me figure out how far apart the top two things are. So this is like a random variable X and P hat is like the random variable in our, pro in our section today. So this X is gonna change to P hat. Well, if that changes to P hat, then this is gonna change to mu of P hat and this is gonna change to sigma of P hat. Now back in section 8.2, we had formulas for these things. The formula for mu of P hat was that it was equal to P. So mu of p hat is just p. 
And the formula for standard deviation of p hat from section 8.2 was square root of pq over n. So that's our test statistic formula for today. Again, there's two things being subtracted on top. And this formula is going to help me figure out how far apart they are. So I want to know how far apart p hat is from p. p hat is my sample percentage and p is the king's claim. What the king claims p is. And this formula will tell me how many steps apart they are. Okay, so there's the formula for the test statistic. Um, yeah, it helps me determine how many steps apart the top two things are that are being subtracted. Okay, and then a condition. Okay, I'm not going to have you check any conditions on quizzes or exams, but it might show up in the online homework. They might talk about the condition a little bit. And also, um, I want to make sure I tell you the complete story and my slide is complete here. So what's the condition? Remember that for everything we do the rest of the semester, central limit theorem applies. In section 8.2, the central limit theorem condition was NP cubed grand equal to 10. And that's what this says here, NP cubed grand equal to 10. Okay, so that's the condition. Again, you don't need to check it, um, but if it shows up in the online homework, you know, you just multiply sample size times P, that's the king's claim of P, Q is one minus P, and the answer better be bigger than equal to 10 for such a limit theorem to apply for this formula to work out and everything to work out. Okay, now we're ready to do a problem, but we're not gonna do a problem yet. Because we have to talk about something else. We have to talk about the p-value method. Okay, so let me just let you know that there's three ways to do a hypothesis test. There's three methods. One of them is called the classical method. The book will call it the classical method. I call it the rejection region method, which is what I taught you last class. That's one way to do a hypothesis. The second way is called the p-value method, which we're gonna talk about right now. And then there's a third way, it's called the confidence interval method. The deal is I can't cover absolutely everything in the book because we'll never finish. So I do pick and choose what I cover and what I don't. So we're going to be skipping this confidence interval method. You know, if you have a friend in another stats class, they may do the confidence interval method, but we skip that. But I need us to learn at least these two methods. So we learned this one last time. Okay. And so we got to learn this PVI method. It's a different way of performing hypothesis. Test. Why do we need a different way? You know, if we have one way, what, why, why, why do we have three ways, right? Definitely, why do we have this PVI method? Why is this one so important? Okay, the reason is because um, when you're given, being given an alpha is a little bit weird, okay? Like, for example, let's say somebody's on trial and we're trying to decide whether to send them to jail or not. And let's say it's like a right tail test, okay? And if the test statistic lands in here, we're gonna, if, if we reject H0, we don't believe the king, we send him to jail. If the test statistic lands in the non-shaded part, we don't send him to jail. Well, if alpha is 0.10, let's say that puts the cutoff line here. So then if your test statistic is there, your test statistic, if your test statistic is there, you send him to jail. If your test statistic's there, you don't send him to jail. If someone else says, no, 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 let's do the problem at a different, with a different alpha, let's say alpha is 0.05 or something like that, then the cutoff line would change to maybe like there. Blue would be the rejection region. So then if the test statistic is in the blue region, you would uh, send them to jail. But if it's in these other regions here that are not the blue region, you wouldn't send them to jail. Deciding whether or not to send the person to jail depends on where the cutoff line is. And the cutoff line is completely determined by alpha. So what's the right alpha to use? Okay, it's a little bit artificial. In these problems, they give you an alpha. They say, use, use this alpha, okay? But in real life court case, they're not gonna give you an alpha so you know for sure if we're past this, you send them to jail, otherwise you don't. In a real life court case, you know, the judge, let's say the case is over, the judge is gonna tell the jury, okay, go back now and decide if we should send this person to jail and use an alpha of 0.05. Like the judge doesn't do that, right? What the, they do is they say, um, by your judgment, okay, beyond a reasonable doubt, is there enough evidence to send the person to jail? You have to make a judgment on your own. So 
when the problem gives you an alpha, it's easier, okay? Because you figure out the cutoff line, then you could decide if you should send the person to jail or not kind of thing, if you should believe the king or not. But we want to be able to do problems when alpha is not given. Okay, so that's the idea. And that's the benefit of the p-value method. The p-value method will help us perform a hypothesis test without an alpha. So this p-value method is a second way of performing hypothesis tests. If you're given an alpha, you can do it. But if you're not given an alpha, you can still do the problem using the p-value method. You can't use the classical method, the rejection region method, if you don't have an alpha. Okay, so it's just a little bit artificial that they would even give you an alpha because again, the alpha totally determines the cutoff line, but you should really determine whether or not to send the person to jail as opposed to just some number determining it for you. All right. So anyway, so we're gonna learn another way to do a hypothesis called the p-value method. Here's things we need to know about p-values. First of all, a p-value is a probability or it's an area. You're gonna be finding an area. Okay, p-value is always calculated for a test statistic. So you know how last time I told you when you uh, perform a hypothesis, you always do it in four steps. The second step was the rejection region. And then the third step was the, P, the test statistic. Well, the, when you do the problem using the p-value method, the rejection region part is gonna go away and the test statistic will become the second step. You have to find the test statistic first before you can find the p-value. Once you found your test statistic, then you can figure out what the p-value is. Okay, so you have to know the test statistic before you find the p-value. So the test statistic would be the second step, the p-value would be the third step is what's gonna happen. All right, now, once you found the p-value, how do you decide if you should reject H0 or not? Okay, I'm gonna tell you something that I want you to memorize for the moment and then, well, memorize it, but in a little while, I'll try to explain why it's correct. So if you're doing a problem using the p-value method and alpha is given, then if the p-value is less than alpha, you reject H0. That's what I want you to memorize. If you reject, if the p-value is less than alpha, that's when you reject H0. P-value is an area. Alpha is also an area. Alpha is the area of the rejection region. If the p-value is less than that, then you reject H0. So memorize that one. Well, then what if the p-value is bigger than alpha? Then you're not going to reject H0. So what I would do is I would memorize the first one. If the p-value is less than alpha, you reject H0. Then the second one, kind of, you'll be able to remember. If it's not less than alpha, then you do not reject H0. Again, I'll explain to you why this is correct later on. Okay, but memorize that for the moment. But now, what if alpha is not given? Then what do you do? Okay, well, here's the deal. Alpha, which is the significance cell, which is the area of the rejection region, it's always a very small number. Most of the time in problems, not all the time, but almost all the time, an alpha will be 10%, that's 0 0.10, or 5%, 0 0.05, or 1%, 0 0.01. These are the three most common alphas. I'm not saying you couldn't get another one, but those are three very common ones. 0 0.10, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 10%, 5%, 1%, they're, they're small numbers, okay? And here it's saying, if the p-value is less than that, so alpha is already a small number. If the p-value is less than that small number, you're going to reject H0. So basically that means the p-value has got to be really small to reject H0. So what if you don't have an alpha? Then the answer is if alpha is not given, then you're going to, you're going to basically, the condition is going to change from p-value less than alpha to if the p-value is small. So if it's small, then you reject H0. And if the p-value is big, then you do not reject H0. Let's go over that one more time. So if alpha is given, if the p-value is less than alpha, you reject H0. If the p-value is bigger than alpha, you don't reject H0. That if you're, that's if you're doing a p-value problem and alpha is given. But if there is no alpha, then you're gonna look at the p-value and you're gonna decide on your own oh, I look at it, I think it's small, so I'm gonna reject H0. Or you look at your p-value and you go, oh, it looks like it's a big number, I do not reject H0. The only question now is what's big, what's small? Okay, for the most part, it's gonna be by your judgment. You're gonna look at it and go, oh, I think that's big, I reject H0, or I think that's small, I do not reject H0. Let's go click through this. So again, if the p-value is small, 
enough by your judgments, then you reject H0. So when juries go to decide if someone should go to jail or not, if they really could calculate a p-value, then they all calculate their p-values. And then if they get very small numbers, they'll say, send them to jail. Big number, nope, we're not sending them to jail like that. So if the p-value is small, you reject H0. Again, if the p-value is big, you do not reject H0. Um, okay, so again, the question now is what's big, what's small, okay? For, so you're gonna use your judgment, but there's gonna be some situations where um, it'll be pretty clear to see if uh, it's small or big. So again, I told you before, every alpha you would see in a problem would be between 1%, 0.01 and 10%, 0 0.10. Those are the most common alphas, okay, the, between here, okay. So when you calculate your p-value, if it's here, meaning less than 1%, then the p-value we're all gonna agree is small. So if you ever get a p-value less than 1%, less than 0.01, then we're all gonna agree it's small. And in that situation, you reject H0. Okay, so what's big, what's small? Definitely less than 1% is small. Okay, if your p-value is over here, bigger than 10%, then it's gonna be bigger than any alpha I would give you. So definitely we're gonna say it's big. So if you get a p-value bigger than 10%, we're going to say it's big, and you're going to not reject H0. Do not reject H0. The only time where you really have to use your judgment is if the p-value is between 1% and 10%. If your p-value is between 1% and 10%, like let's say it's 3% or something like that, then you're on your own. You have to just decide on your own if you think it's big or small. You're gonna use your judgment. Now, I know that might feel uncomfortable, but I will accept both answers. I don't care. You just gotta tell me what you've decided. Like, let's say you get a p-value of 0.03, 3%. Then I want you to write, I think this is small, so I'm rejecting H0. Or you can write, I think this is big, so I'm not rejecting H0. I don't care, just decide on your own. When do you decide on your own? If your p-value is between one and 10%, then just tell me, I'm gonna say this is big, so I'm not rejecting H0, or I'm gonna say this is small, so I do not reject H0. Just write all that out. I don't want you just to write reject H0 because I'm gonna wonder why you're writing that. But if you write, it's small, therefore I'm rejecting, I'm, you're letting me know I'm saying it's small. I'm, by my judgment is saying it's small, so you reject H0 or I'm deciding it's big. So just write, it's big, or I'm deciding it's big, so do not reject H0. Okay, so one last time. If the p-value is less than 1%, you're gonna automatically say it's small and reject H0. If the p-value is bigger than 10%, you're automatically gonna say it's big and do not reject H0. But if it's between one and 10%, then you make the call, but just tell me what call you made. Say, I'm saying it's small, therefore I'm rejecting H0, or I'm saying it's big, therefore I'm gonna not reject H0. You know, if you were on a jury and we're gonna send the person to jail, and let's say it really came down to calculating some p-value. You calculate a p-value, you're trying to decide, should I vote guilty or not guilty for this person? It also depends on what they did, right? If they're gonna to go to jail for the rest of their life and you get a p-value of 0.03, you might say, you know what? That's not small enough for me. I'm gonna say it's big. But if they're gonna to go to jail for a month because they did some little whatever thing, you might say 0.03, that's small enough, send him to jail, he'll be out in a month, no problem. So it also depends on the severity of the thing. So like if it's a really severe uh, crime, let's say, then you want an extra small p-value to fill, because you know if you send the person to jail and you're wrong, you ruin the person's life. So you want a very low p-value. Um, that way you're more confident that you should send the person to jail, that kind of thing. All right, sounds good. I haven't even taught you how to calculate a p-value yet, but just some things to know about p-values. And this last thing says, the p-value tells you how deep into the rejection region your test statistic is. So let's say you're doing a problem using the rejection region method and you get your cutoff line is right here and this shaded region is the rejection region. If your test statistic lands right there, like it barely got into the rejection region, then you're gonna say reject H0, send the king to jail. But because it's so close to this cutoff line, 
you might worry a little like, well, did I make the right decision? But if your, P, if your test statistic is here, more in the rejection region, you'd be like, oh, I feel a little more confident we should send the king to jail, we should reject eight zero. If the, P, if the test statistic is way deep into the rejection region like that one, then you feel even more confident. So the further down, the deeper it is into the rejection region, the more you have faith that you've made a correct conclusion. You never know if you've made a correct conclusion, but you have, you feel a little more confident that you made the right conclusion. And the p-value gets smaller the deeper uh, we go in the rejection region. So um, the p-value tells you how deep in the rejection region you are. So we get a very small p-value, then that tells me the test statistic is deep in the rejection region, and I feel a little more confident saying reject H0. Okay, so two more things, and then we can finally do a problem. So I got to teach you how do you calculate a p-value, and then I'm going to try to briefly explain why you're supposed to reject H0 when the p-value is less than alpha, and then we'll do a problem. Okay, first day of class, I told you that you need a TI-83 or TI-84 calculator for this class. If you guys have it, fantastic. If you don't have it, you need to have it now. Basically, it's um, you could have survived up till this point without it, but calculating p-values, the only way we're going to be able to do it is with the, the TI-84 calculator or TI-83. So, um, if, make sure you guys have those if you don't have them by now. And I'll show you how to do it uh, in a little bit. So how do you calculate a p-value? Well, it depends on if it's a left tail test, right tail test, or two tail test. So I'm going to go over each one. Let's say it's a left tail test. Basically, this is what you're going to do. First thing you do is you're going to calculate test statistic. Remember, you can't find, TS stands for test statistic. You can't find the p-value if you don't know the test statistic. Find the test statistic first, then you draw a picture. This would be the Z distribution. And then you put the test statistic in the picture. Let's say it's over here. And then you go up to the curve and shade to the left. Why am I shading to the left? If it's a left tail test, you shade to the left. So all I, all I really said there was put your test statistic in the picture, go up to the curve, shade to the left. And that area there is the p-value. Don't forget, a p-value is an area. At least that's how you find the p-value for a left tail test. And then we'll have the calculator calculate the number for us. But that's what it is. So let me say it one more time. So you calculate, don't worry about that. You calculate the test statistic, put in the picture, go up to the curve and shade to the left. Again, why are we shading the left? If it's a left tail test, you shade to the left. That area that's in black there is the p-value. And again, the calculator will calculate it for us. Okay, if it's a right tail test, Again, what do you do first? First thing you do is you calculate the test statistic and you put in the picture. Again, don't worry about this part over here, but calculate the test statistic, put in the picture. Then you're gonna go, because it's a right tail test, you're gonna go up to the curve and shade to the right and that area is the p-value. So you put the test statistic in the picture, up to the curve, shade to the right, whatever you just shaded, that's the p-value. If it's a two tail test, that one's a little bit different. Let's say you, can, you get your test statistic and it's a 1.7. Okay, well, if it's a two-tail test, you're gonna have to put two tick marks in the picture. Use a two-tail test. You have to go up to the curve on both of them and shade the ends. Shade to the left of the left one, shade to the right of the right one. You do that when it's a two-tail test. You, the, our test statistic is positive. That means this one is 1.7 because the numbers on this side of zero are positive. Well, what's this number then? You have to put two numbers in the picture. If your, te your test statistic is only one number though, if this is 1.7, this other number is negative 1.7. So basically what I'm telling you is you have to put the test statistic and the test statistic with its sign changed in the picture, go up to the curve on both of them and then shade the end, shade to the left of the left one, shade to the right of the right one. And the total of those two areas is the p-value total of those two areas. Uh, let's do that again. Let's say the test statistic is a negative number, like negative 2.96. Okay. So again, what you do is you draw a picture. This is again, Z distribution, because we're using Z distribution today. Because it's a two tail test, you put two tick marks, one on the left, one on the right, go up to the curve on both of them and shade to the left of the left one, and shade to the right of the right one to label these numbers. Which one is the test statistic? This one, because the test statistic is negative. Negative numbers are on the left of zero. 
This is negative 2.96. So you got to not only put negative 2.96 in the picture, but also positive 2.96. The other one is positive 2.96. Then you got these two areas, and you got to find the total of those two areas, and that's what the p value is. And again, we'll type it in the calculator, and the calculator will calculate it for us. So don't worry about this crazy notation here. But again, you're going to put two lines up to the curve, shade to the ends. One, one of these will be the test statistic. The other one will be the test statistic with its sign change. And the total of those two areas is the p-value. All right, any questions so far? All right, sounds good. <clears throat> so now let's go through this. How do we know that we should reject H0 if the p-value is less than alpha? I told you to memorize that. Why is that correct? Why should you reject H0 when the p value is less than alpha? Okay, so I'm just going to briefly explain this if it's a left tail test. But if it's a right tail test or if it's a two tail test, I can explain it similarly. I'm, not, I'm just not going to. I'm not going to waste the time. But if it's a left tail test, let's see what's happening here. So suppose it's a left tail test and suppose alpha is given. Okay, because if alpha is not given, how can I know if the p value is less than alpha? So suppose alpha is given. Okay. Then the rejection region is this red region over here. Okay, so once we have an alpha, we can calculate this red region. There's the cutoff number for the rejection region. And now if the test statistic lands here, we reject H0. If the test statistic lands outside of the shaded region, we don't reject H0. Oops. Let's first suppose the test statistic is inside the rejection region. So it's there. Because the test statistic landed in the rejection region, we reject H0. All you're doing from what we learned last time is you're comparing your test statistic number to this cutoff number, okay? And in this case, if the test statistic is on the left of the cutoff number, that means the test statistic is in the rejection region, so we reject H0. So we basically compare this number and this number on this number line. We're comparing two numbers on the number line, okay? That's how we did it last time. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate the p-value. So what's the p-value? Remember, how do you find a p-value for a left tail test? You put the test statistic in the picture. There it is. You go up to the curve and you shade to the left. The area I'm shading in black here is the p-value. Okay, take a look at the... Okay, so let me erase this right here. So the red area is alpha, because that stands for the area of the rejection region. And the p-value is this black area over here from the test statistic to the left. You guys tell me which one is bigger, the black area or the red area? When I say red area, it's kind of covered here, but this is the red area right, right here, and that's the black area. Which one's bigger, red area or black area? Red. The red one is bigger. The red one is alpha. Alpha is the bigger one. The p-value, which is the black area, is smaller. So in this picture, the p-value is less than alpha, and in this picture, you reject H0 because the test statistic is in the rejection region. So basically what's happening is instead of comparing where this number is and where this number is on the number line, we're comparing two areas, the black area and the red area. We're just comparing those areas to see which one's bigger. So if the test statistic is in the rejection region, the p-value area will be smaller than the red area, the alpha. So that's the deal there. If the p-value is less than alpha, we reject H0. If the test statistic was here, right on the cutoff number, then when you find the p-value, you have to shade all this, then the p-value would be equal to alpha, okay? So again, if the test statistic is more to the left, then there's gonna be less area. And if it's more to the left, then we're gonna reject H0. So that's what that says. If the p-value is less than alpha, we reject H0. So in, in this picture here, the p-value is less than alpha, and in this picture here, we reject H0. Now, Let's suppose the test statistic is not in the rejection region. Let's say it's over here. Well, if the test statistic is not in the rejection region, you don't reject H0. But let's think about what the p-value is. Again, it's a left tail test. So how would you do it? You'd have to go from the test statistic up to the curve and shade to the left. And that black area is the p-value. Okay, in this picture, which one is bigger, the red area or the black area? Which one is bigger? Anyone tell me? 
the black, black area. area. The black area is bigger than the red area. That's right. So in this picture, the p value, which is the black area, is greater than alpha, which is the red area. So the black area is bigger. And this happened because the test statistic was outside the rejection region. And when the test statistic is outside the rejection region, you do not reject at zero. Okay, so just remember that. When the p-value is less than alpha, you reject at zero. When the p-value is bigger than alpha, you don't reject at zero. And again, it's just a different way of doing it where instead of comparing two numbers on the number line, this cutoff number and our test statistic number, we're comparing two areas, the alpha area and the p-value area. And anyway, we have similar results for right tail tests and two tail tests, but I'm not going to go over that. All right. We are now ready to do a problem. Okay, so let's go ahead and read this problem. In 1994, 52% of parents of children in high school felt it was a serious problem that high school students were not being taught enough math and science. A recent survey found that 256 of 800 parents of children in high school felt it was a serious problem that high school students were not being taught enough math and science. Do parents feel differently than they did in 1994? Part A says, perform the appropriate hypothesis test using the rejection region method at the 0.05 significance level. Part B says to do the problem over using the p-value method. And then part C is talking about the meaning of the significance level. Be prepared on future quizzes and exams um, for me to ask you questions like, what's a type one error? What's a type two error? And what's the meaning of the significance level? Every once in a while, I'll ask you, what is a type one error? What is a type two error? Like I think on the quiz today, I asked that. Um, but I don't ask those all the time, but once in a while. But almost always, I'll ask you, what's the meaning of a significance level? So make sure you're able to do that. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do part B first, the PVI method first, since we just talked about PVI method. Then we'll do the problem over using the method we did last class, the rejection region method. And we'll talk about this meaning of the significance level afterwards. All right. So let's go to the next slide. I guess the first thing we should do, so see I'm doing part B first, p value method first. The very first thing we should do is recognize that it's a hypothesis test question. How do we know it's a hypothesis test? Well, um, if you just read what's, what I've left over here, the only indication is that it says p value. So p, if you see p value, it's a hypothesis test for sure. If you go back to this slide, it says perform a hypothesis test. So that's really good, you know. Some problems are worded better than others. If they say do a hypothesis test, you know it's a hypothesis test problem. If they say, if they mention rejection region, if they mention level of significance, or if they give you an alpha, these are all hints that it's a hypothesis test problem. Rejection region, p-value, level of significance, you only hear these phrases if it's a hypothesis test problem. The reason I'm going through that is because again, on the final, you're gonna have all sorts of questions, you know, from the entire class and some are going to be hypothesis test problems, some of them are not. And it's just very common that I'll give a person a hypothesis test problem and they'll do something else, like build a confidence interval or something. So I guess the first thing I want to practice for the final, not for your next exam, because your next exam, everything's going to be a hypothesis test on your next exam. But on the final, you want to read the problem and go, okay, this is a hypothesis test problem. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear that it's a hypothesis test problem. So whenever you do a hypothesis test problem, you're going to do it in four steps. First step is going to write down the hypothesis tests. You're going to write down what the king and peasant are fighting over. What is the argument that they're having? Okay. So the next thing is we have to know what letter they're fighting over. In this problem, they're fighting over P, a percentage. Now, how do we know that? So there's a couple of hints that they're fighting over P. Last class, they were fighting over mu. So they do mention a percentage here. That's a little bit of a hint that it's a percentage problem. This p-value does not mean it's a percentage problem, okay? 52%. But the dead giveaway to know if it's a percentage problem is, is the question that's being asked of people a yes or no question? If the data you're collecting is yeses and nos, it's going to be a percentage problem. And basically what they did is they asked 800 parents a question, do you think it's a problem that people are not being taught enough math and science? What kind of answers are you gonna give? Hey, do you think it's a problem? They're not gonna give you a number, they're not gonna say like 82. You know, they're gonna say yes or no. So the answer are yeses and nos. That's what makes this a percentage problem. 
So it's definitely a percentage problem. Um, the next thing is the king's claim always has an equal sign. Okay, now we got to figure out what number goes here. All right. Now, I mentioned this to you before. This is not going to happen in every hypothesis problem, but this happened in all the problems in last section, and I think the first couple of examples in this section, but it doesn't always happen. Remember that every stats problem is about a big group, a population. But in this problem, they talk about two big groups, okay, two populations. But only one of them is the one the question's about. So let me go ahead and read the problem again. It says, in 1994, 52% <clears throat> of parents of children in high school. So one of the populations is, um, so I'm going to write down like the first population that's mentioned in this problem is all parents of children in high school in 1994. So if a parent had a child in high school in 1994, they belong to this group. That's a population. And the percentage of them that thought it was a serious problem that, that high school students are not being taught on math and science was 52%. And no one is arguing over this percentage. So there's no argument. It's 52% case closed. But then there's a second population because it says a recent survey. That's not 1994. It's recent. It's now. Okay, so do parents feel differently now than they did in 1994? So it's a different group of people. The second population is all parents of children in high school now. Not in 1994, but now. That's a different group of people. What's the percentage of them that think it's a problem that high school students are not being taught enough math and science? This one, we don't know. The king and peasant are arguing over this. So this is the population that the question's about. We care about now. We don't care about what happened in 94. So why do they mention the 94 people? To hand you this number, to give you a number to use in your test. Okay, so make sure you understand the difference between these two populations. If any of you have a brother or sister in high school right now, then your parents are in this group because your parents are a parent that have a child in high school now, okay? Whereas my parents are in this group because I was in high school in 1994, basically. So my parents are in this group. My parents are not in this group because my parents do not have a child in high school right now. Okay, so it's a different group of people. This is the group the question's about. What is this percentage? The king and peasant are fighting over it. Again, why do they mention this group? They're just trying to say back then it was 52%. Again, no argument. What is it now? And the king is going to say, I think what it is now is the same as it was back then. And the peasant is going to say, no, it's something else. Okay, so I just want to make sure you're aware of that. This doesn't always happen. But in this problem, there's two populations mentioned. This is the population the question's about. This one is just mentioned to explain where this number came from. You're going to use this number in your test. So this is going to be 52%. But one last time, to make sure we understand this. I don't want you to read this as the percentage of people in 94 who thought it was a problem is 52%. That's not what this says. This says this percentage is about now. Everything we're doing in the problem is about now. The percentage of people who think it's a problem now, the king is saying he thinks it's 52%. And the peasant's going to say that percentage is something else. Okay, so both of these P's have to do with now, not in 94. Okay, because in 94, there's no argument. It's 50% case closed. All right. Notice I'm taking my time. You really want to take your time figuring out H0 and H1. You know, figure out it's a hypothesis problem. Figure out what letter they're fighting over. Because, again, if you get those things wrong... If you think they're fighting over a percentage and they're fighting over an average, there's going to be no room for partial credit pretty much because you can use the wrong formula, the wrong table, wrong everything. So first things first, take your time getting the hypothesis right. Okay, so now that we have the king's claim, whatever number is used for the king's claim, 
You can use the same number for the peasant's claim. But we got to figure out what symbol goes there. Remember, the peasant's claim will have a less than, a greater than, or a not equal to. What do you think it is? So here's oh, not, not 52? Yeah, it's not 52, right. OK. Um, the reason it's not equal to, they say, do parents feel differently? But they don't say, we think the percentage went up or it went down. They don't give you like a direction. They just say, we think it's different. So you're going to put not equal to there. OK, is everybody with me on that? Yes. Awesome. OK, so there's the king and peasant's claim. And then anytime you use a symbol, in this case, we use this letter P here, you got to write down what it stands for in words. Let me do that here. P is, and we've done this many times before, explaining what a percentage is. The very first thing you write is the percentage of So that's that part. And then the next thing, a percentage compares the size of two groups. You got to mention two groups now. The first group I got to mention is the big group, the population, the percentage of all parents of children in high school in 1994. It took me three lines to explain that, but that's the population right there. You don't have to write these little things. I'm just trying to explain how I'm organizing my answer here. So percentage of, then you write the population, all parents of children in high school. Oh, not in 1994, sorry, now. Oh, that's really bad. So don't write in 94. The percentage of all parents of children in high school now. The word, so when you write down the population, make sure you put the word all, that's an important word. Um, and also the word now is very important because in this problem, two populations are mentioned. You got to let me know which one the problem is about. So it's about the parents now. And now you got to describe the part of this population that will say yes to your question. So which of them we're going to say yes? The ones that feel it's a serious problem, um, that feel it's a serious problem. Sorry, this is. Um, uh, kind of a lot of words here, but we'll get through it. That feel it's a serious problem that high school students are not being taught enough math and science. So this is the another group, the people that would say yes to your question. All right. So again, you don't have to write this stuff down. I'm just letting you know how I wrote my answer. So percentage of, and then I mentioned the population, and then the part of the population that would say yes to your question if you ask them. Those are the ones that do feel it's a problem. All right, that's the hypothesis part. Any questions on that part? Okay, since we're doing p-value method, the second step is the test statistic part. Okay, so the test statistic formula is p hat minus p over square root of pq over n. So what, what I do is before we plug into this, I wanna write down all the numbers that I need in order to plug into this. What I need in this section, I need n. n is a sample size, because you see the n down there. Uh, in this case, this sentence here, a recent survey found that 256 of 800 parents, that means they talked to 800 parents and 256 of them said, yes, it's a problem. So N is a sample size, N is 800. I need to write down P hat. Before I write down P hat, I'm gonna write something else called X. In a percentage problem, X is the number of people you talk to that said yes to the question. So X is gonna be 256. So N people total, this many said yes. And then I'm gonna write down p hat. Now there is a formula for p hat, it's x over n, but I think it's maybe a little too ridiculous to even have a formula because we know how to find this percentage. You just divide the numbers. The 256 goes on top, the 800 goes on the bottom. Whenever you calculate a percentage, um, in this class anyway, the types of percentage we, looks at, we look at in this class, um, the bigger number goes on the bottom. So 800 on the bottom, 256 on top. If that number is ugly, you can just leave it as 256 over 800. 
but I think if you do that on the calculator, I think it's a, a nice number. Yeah, it's just 0 0.32. So I'm going to go ahead and write it as 0 0.32. But if it turns out to be an ugly number, leave the fraction. There's nothing wrong with the fraction. I don't want you to round it, is what I'm saying. Then we plug into the test statistics formula p hat minus p over square root of pq over n. All right, so p hat is 0 0.32. p is the king's claim of p. It's over here, 52%. Make sure you write it as a decimal. So I'm going to write 0 0.52 for that. Okay, now on the bottom, this square root, just be careful here. Sometimes people put, plug in the wrong number. This is a P, not a P hat. So you're going to be putting 0.52 there. So, okay, so we're putting whatever number is there, we put the same number there. Sometimes people put the P hat answer there instead. Okay, so just be careful. It's, I mean, I give you the formula, but still, just be careful. You got to put P there. Okay, so it's going to be 0.52. That's P. Q is 1 minus that, so that's 0.48 over N. N is 800. Square root of all that. And we're going to calculate this on the calculator. All right, so let me go ahead and type this in real quick. So 0.32 minus 0.52. Answer. Divide. Open square root. I think the only issue you would have when you type this in the calculator just, just get the top answer, okay? Then push divide, then open the root. But now, if you have the kind of calculator that after you open a root, a parenthesis symbol shows up, if that happens, I've told you this before, but just, you know, it's very important advice. If, not all calculators do this either, but if your calculator does that, when you open the root, a parenthesis shows up, my advice to you is to open more parentheses before you type all this in. Because if you don't, and you go and type in 0.52, and you close the parentheses on the 0.52, as soon as you close the one that opens, your root is over. So now if you type 0.48, this won't be in the root. And we need it all to be in the root. So to make sure all that mess is in the root, what I would do, again, if a parentheses opens up, open a few more. Just It's above the number 8 on your calculator. Just open a few more. Let's push it like 3, 4, 5 times. doesn't matter. Then type 0.52 times 0.48 divided by 800. And then get your answer. And when you get your answer, when you push enter, it'll close all the parentheses that you open. So you don't have to worry about closing them all. The answer to this is negative 11.322-77034. If you got that answer, you typed it in right. Okay. Any questions on the test statistic part? All right. Uh, so then the next part, the third, so this, so when you're doing the problem using the p-value method, first you do the hypothesis test, then you write down the test statistic, then the third step is the p-value part. So the p-value part is a picture somewhat similar to the rejection region picture, but not exactly. So remember, when you're doing a rejection region method, the test statistic step is third. But for p-value method, the test statistic step is second, because you need that before you can calculate the p-value. When you calculate the p-value, you write down alpha if one is given to you, which it is, even though we don't see it here. I got to go back a couple slides. Oh, right there. Alpha is 0.05 for this problem. So you write down the alpha. And most of the time, you would write down degrees of freedom. But we're not going to write down degrees of freedom today because when it's a percentage problem, we're using z distribution. Z distribution doesn't have degrees of freedom. So no degrees of freedom here. We go straight to drawing a picture. This is the z distribution that I'm drawing. Okay, is this a one-tail test or a two-tail test? So the way to figure that out, if you don't know, is you look at H1. Here's H1. Is that a one-tail? Is it a left-tail, right-tail, or two-tail test? Is it? What? Uh, a um, two-tail test. Two-tail. That's right. When H1 is a not equal to, it's a two-tail test. Right. So what you're going to do is you're going to put two tick marks, one on the left, one on the right. You're going to go up to the curve on the left and shade to the left. 
and go up to the curve on the right and shade to the right. All right. Now, if this was rejection region method, I would label the areas right now and then find the numbers on the bottom. P-value is kind of the opposite. We're first gonna label the bottom numbers and then we're gonna find the area, okay? So for p-value method, you gotta put your test statistic in the picture. Let me go back and see what the test statistic was. Here it is, negative 11.32277034. Because it's negative, it goes here. Negative 11.32277034. That's that number. You do have to label this one as well. That's just gonna be the positive version of the number, 11.322. 77034. So for, for PVI method, label the number or numbers on the bottom first, and then you got to calculate the area here. Now, when I'm grading the p-value thing, usually the p-value thing is, a, is three points. The reason is because the picture is one point, the picture I just drew, and then the notation, I'm going to show you the notation for it, is another point, and then calculating it correctly is another point. So the way you find the p-value, the, the way you write down the notation for the p-value, well, we've talked about this way back in chapter seven. This area here, areas are probabilities. This is the probability, z, because it's z distribution, less than negative 11.322.77034. This right here is the notation for just this area. But to find the p-value, you gotta find the area of each one separately and then add them up. So it's gonna be plus. And now who can tell me the notation for this area here? So the reason why this is the notation for the first one is because we're doing, the, that's the area to the left. When you do area to the left, you put z less than. So, this here is the area to the right of 11.3, whatever. So it's going to be probability Z greater than the positive 11.322.77034. Do you guys understand the notation? Any questions? Now, the most important part, how do you type this in the calculator? Okay, so again, if you have your TI-84 in front of you or 83 or whatever it is, that would be the best. So we got to make sure we understand how to type this in. So, okay, <clears throat> let's get the calculator out. All right, so here's the thing. You have to tell the calculator, find this area, then find this area, and then add them up. Okay, but they're both going to be the same area, okay? I don't know if they look the same or not, but you should try to make them look kind of close to the same. They're going to be the same. So what I do when it's a two-tail test, this is only for a two-tail test, what I do is I just pick one of the tails. Let's say I pick the left one. I'll type that in the calculator to get this area. And then I won't waste the time typing in the right one. I'll just take the, the first answer I get and multiply by two. Multiplying by two will we'll count this one as well, kind of thing, because they're the same area. Like if this area here is 4%, this one's going to be 4% as well. So the PVI is going to be 8%. So I'll just take the 4% and multiply by two. You only multiply by two when it's a two tail test. But again, if it's a one tail test, like if it was just the left tail, just type the left tail in, whatever answer you get, that's the answer. Don't multiply by two or anything. You only multiply by two when it's a two tail test. Let me say it one more time. When it's a two tail test, pick one of the tails, whichever one you want, type it in the calculator and then multiply your answer by two. So we can pick either tail. I'm gonna go ahead and you do the left tail. So let's, I wanna cover up the right tail because I don't want you to get confused and look at, don't even look at the right tail. We're just gonna type the left tail in, get the answer and then multiply by two. Here's how you do that. So you're gonna push second and then distribution is right here. It's the button that says VARS. Right above it in blue, it says distribution. So second distribution, okay. Then you're gonna go, because this is the Z distribution, you're gonna use the one that says normal CDF. You know, we're gonna do this down the road with other distributions. We'll use like for chi-squared, you see a chi-squared here, there's a T here for a T distribution. But if it's Z distribution, you can use normal. Normal CDF, don't ever use the one that says PDF. We're never gonna use that one. So normal CDF, enter. All right, now your calculator may or may not look like this. 
So let me first talk to you about what you do if, if, it, if it shows like this on your calculator. So again, I'm just typing this area in. Just ignore the right one for now. Just forget it's even there. You got to tell the calculator this area here, where does the area start and where does the area end? In other words, what's the left edge of the area and what's the right edge? The right edge of the area is at the number negative 11.322. That's the right edge. Okay. What's the left edge? Well, there really isn't a left edge because this area really goes to the left forever. Since it goes to the left forever, you got to type in negative infinity. It's like the area starts at negative infinity and goes all the way to negative 11.322. You have to type the left edge first, then the right edge. The left edge is called the lower on this calculator. The right edge is called the upper. So we got to type negative infinity. There's no negative infinity button on the calculator. So what I do is I type negative. This is the negative sign, by the way, down here. Don't accidentally push this for negative. If you do that, it's going to give you an error. Don't use the subtraction symbol. Just use the negative symbol. Negative. And then infinity, what I do is I just type like five nines. Like a really big number is what I type in. Negative big number. That's like negative infinity. And then for the upper, I'm going to type the right edge here, which is negative, negative, 11.322.77034. Now, after that, these should say, if your calculator displays it like this, it should say zero and one here. If it doesn't say zero one, then type it, type zero one, because you know for the standard normal distribution, the mean is zero, standard deviation is one. Uh, and then you can go down here and push paste and enter. Now, if your calculator does not show it like that, then you have like a, a slightly older model of the calculator, then it'll look like this. It'll just say normal CDF. And then you'll type in, again, the left edge, negative 99999, comma. The comma you have to type in is right above the seven. So here's seven, the button right above it, okay? Comma, then you type negative 11.322.770340. The left edge, then the right edge. And then you push enter. Now, if you look on my calculator, it says zero one after comma zero comma one. You can type that in if you want. But if you don't, the computer, the, the calculator will automatically assume zero one. So you don't have to type the zero one in. Anyway, enter and we get zero. Okay, that is the area. That's how you type in uh, to the calculator to find the area that you see in this picture here, just the left tail area. Is everybody with me? Yes. Okay. Now, I do want to uh, let you know that th the area here is not actually zero. Areas cannot be zero, okay? Areas are always positive. So why are we getting zero? The reason we're getting zero is because this area is so super small that the calculator is rounding it to zero. The, the real answer is zero point a whole bunch of zeros, like zero point zero 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 zero, like, like, like 30 zeros or whatever, and then some, no some numbers after that. But it's so far down the line that it just rounded to zero. But if you get zero on your calculator, that's what I want you to write as your answer. So don't worry about it. Just know that it can't actually be zero. Okay. Now that's not the answer. What you're supposed to do now is multiply it by two because whatever that answer is, this tail is the same answer. So you multiply by two to count both tails times two. It shouldn't be too much of a shock. You're gonna get zero. So the p-value is zero. Again, it's not really zero. It's just a super small number that the calculator is rounding and saying it's zero. So again, if you do it that way, you can just write zero here and I'll take it because that's what the calculator gave you. Okay, I wanna do this problem one more time. You don't have to do it one more time. You can just write zero and then we can move on. But just for a little more practice, I'm just gonna do it again, okay? You do not have to do it twice. What I'm gonna do this time is I'm just going to type the right tail area in, get the answer, and multiply by two. So again, when you do the problem, pick a tail, whichever one you want. Type it in, get the answer, then multiply by two if it's a two-tail test. So this time I'm going to cover up the left one so I don't even look at it. I want to type this area into the calculator. So this is the way you do that. So you're going to go second, distribution. You're going to go down to normal CDF because we're using the Z distribution today. Let me get rid of these numbers. Okay, so let's go back. So I'm trying to type in this area here. You have to tell the calculator <coughs> the left edge of the area first, that's the lower, then the right edge. The left edge of this area is positive 11.322.77034. Let me type that in. 
Okay, then the right edge, well, where's the right edge of the area? Well, this area goes to the right forever. If it goes to the right forever, it goes to positive infinity. If we go to the left forever, it's negative infinity. You go to the right forever, it's positive infinity. So we have to type positive infinity. There's no positive infinity button, so I just type in a really big number, usually like five nines is what I do. Okay, so from positive 11, whatever, to 99999. And then again, if your calculator displays it this way, just put 11.32277034 comma 99999. You don't have to type the zero one and get the answer. Oh, the answer is not the same. The answer is not zero this time. Okay, the answer is not zero, but the answer is super small, okay? So it's a little weird, whatever algorithm the calculator is using to calculate it, on the one side, it's getting zero, on the other side, it's giving you this really tiny number, but don't worry about it, just whatever it gives you, leave it alone. This is the area in the right tail, but it's supposed to also be the area in the left tail. So to account for both of them, we have to multiply by two. Please don't forget to multiply by two, and that's the p-value. So depending on what tail, like in this problem, depending on what tail you use, either you're gonna write zero for the p-value or you're gonna write this for the p-value. It doesn't matter, just write down what your calculator gave. I'll know what the two answers are. I'm gonna go ahead and write down this one because I wanna discuss this one. And again, if it's only a one tail test, type the tail in and do not multiply by two. The whole point of multiplying by two is to account for both tails when there's two tails. All right, so the p-value is, and again, you, just, you can just write it exactly the way it comes out on the calculator. So I'm going to write down 1.0396072 e negative 29. You can just write it like that. Let's make sure we understand what this e negative 29 means. e negative 29 means take this decimal point and move it 29 times to the left. 29 times to the left, that's what that means. So you don't have to actually do that, but that's what it means, know what it means. So this answer is really zero point, and then a lot more zeros, 28 zeros here. It's 29 zeros if you count the one before the decimal point. So it's zero point and then 28 more zeros, and then 10396097 so you see it's a super, super small number. Lots of zeros before you see anything that's not zero. So that's what that means. So I don't want you to think this is a big number. Oh, it's one or something. It's not one. It's point a lot of zeros, 29 zeros total, or 28 zeros after the decimal point, and then one, zero, three, whatever. So it's a super small number. And again, that's why doing it the other way, the calculator just said, screw it, it's zero. Just round it to zero. All right, that's how you find the p-value. Any questions? Okay, so then you have to ask yourself, is the p-value less than alpha? Always ask that. That's the one you memorize. If the p-value is less than alpha, you reject H0. The p-value is 1.0396097 e negative 29. Is that number less than 0.05? Yes or no? Yes. Definitely yes. Remember, the number on the left is really small. It's point a lot of zeros. It's definitely less than 0.05. The answer is yes. So conclusion, if the answer is yes to that. The conclusion is reject H0. So if you guys less than alpha, you reject H0. Okay, then we got to write the answer in words. Let's go back. Rejecting H0 means we're siding with H1. So you want to say evidence suggests H1. One way to write it is evidence suggests that the percentage of all Parents of children in high school now that feel it's a serious problem that high school students are not being taught enough math and science is not 52%. You can write it like that. That's a lot of words. When you write it that way and it's a lot of words, there's some a trick you can try. If the problem asks you a question, you can just answer the question. And there's a question right there. there. Do parents feel differently than they did in 1994? The king is saying they feel the same as they did in 94. And the peasant is saying they feel differently than they did in 94. And since we're believing the peasant, you're just gonna write evidence suggests parents feel differently than they did in 94. It's a much shorter answer for that one. Okay. Evidence suggests. That parents. Feel differently. 
than they did. And that's how you do example one using the PVI method. Any questions? Okay, so now we're gonna do the problem again using the rejection region method, but most of the problem we already did, so I'm not gonna redo those parts. The first thing you would do is you would write down the hypothesis test. We did that already, so I'm not gonna do that again. The second step for rejection region method is to find the rejection region. We didn't do that, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. The rejection region part, you write down alpha, which is 0.05, and you draw a picture. The two tail tests, remember. So the rejection region is going to be on both sides. So you put a tick mark on the left, up to the curve, shade to the left, tick mark on the right, up to the curve, shade to the right. This picture looks like the p-value picture, but it's different. So the p-value step and the rejection region step, they're both pictures. But just how we approach things is a little bit different. So for the rejection region picture, what you do is you first label the areas and then you find the numbers on the bottom. Whereas for a p-value method, you label the numbers on the bottom and then use the calculator to find the areas. So for p-value, for a rejection region method, alpha is the total area of the rejection region. And because the rejection region is in two pieces, each piece gets half of that as its area. So this area here is 0.025, and this area is 0.025. Notice I labeled the areas first, and then we find the numbers on the bottom. That's the rejection region method. Okay, the, the one over here is gonna be the easier one to look up because for Z table, I need to know the area to the left and I know the area to the left of that number is 0.025. And also I know that number is negative, so we need to use the negative side of the Z table. So negative side of the Z table, area to the left, 0.025. Here's the Z table, the negative side of the Z table. I'm looking for 0.025 in the middle here it is. So then you go like this and like this. And that number is negative 1.96. Remember, every table is different. So the Z table, oops. For the Z table, you need to know the area to the left. That's why the left one is easier to look up. So this is negative 1.96. And then this number is positive 1.96. Remember, they're going to be just the same number opposite sign. That's the rejection region. Any questions on that much? Okay, for rejection region method, the third step is the test statistic. We already did that, so I'm not going to do it again. But let me just remind you what it was. It was negative 11.322.77034. And you check to see where this number lands in the picture. And it lands, it's way past negative 1.96. It's negative and way past it. So we do land in the rejection region. So the conclusion is rejected zero. And of course, we're supposed to write in words, but I did that already, so I won't do that again. Okay, so just the order of things are a little bit different. And you know, the picture is different. Do you label the areas, then find the numbers on the bottom, or do you label the numbers on the bottom and then find the areas? Okay, so um, depends on, so for, for rejection region, you label the areas, and then you find the, look up the numbers on the bottom in the table. For p-value method, you put the test statistic and it's negative on the bottom, and then you calculate the area with the calculator. All right, that's how you do this problem using the rejection region method. Any questions on that? Okay, then last thing, part C, what's the meaning of the 0.03 sigma cell? I don't know why it says 0.03 when we did this problem at the 0.05, but whatever. Just like it was before, you're going to say it basically the exact same way. You're going to write, if you perform the same hypothesis tests, many times, each time with a new sample, Basically, if you run the same hypothesis over and over again, what will happen, you'll make a type one error, but don't write type one error. What's a type one error? It's, it's you, uh, rejecting H0 when H0 is true. So you will reject H0 
Join HL screw. About three percent of the time. Okay, so it's the same, you say exactly the same way. Just change this to a percent and write that about that percent of the time now. A claim has been made that more than 50% of Rio Hano students have a job. To test the claim, 47 Rio Hano students were polled and asked if they have a job. Of the 47 students polled, 31 said that they do have a job. Party says use the PVI method to test the claim that more than 50% of Rio Hano students have a job at the alpha equals 0.03 sig difference level. Okay, so very first thing we need to do is recognize that this is a hypothesis problem. When exam four comes, every problem is gonna be a hypothesis problem. So that's not gonna be an issue. But when the, when the final comes, you're gonna have a little bit of everything. There's gonna be some hypothesis, some confidence intervals, some probability questions, a little bit of everything. So we need to practice recognizing it's a hypothesis problem because if you if it's a hypothesis problem and you don't and you do like a confidence interval instead, you know you're not going to get any points. So how can we tell this problem is a hypothesis problem? Sometimes the test will the problem will say perform a hypothesis test. That'd be awesome if it said that. This one doesn't say that. It says test the claim though, so that's a phrase that usually you see in hypothesis tests. So that's good. Uh, it gives you an alpha which is a hint that it's a hypothesis test, but dead giveaways are significance level because significance level, you only hear that phrase when you're doing hypothesis tests. And p-value method, definitely, you're only gonna see that when you're performing a hypothesis test. So read the problem carefully, but make sure you're clear that it's a hypothesis problem before you go on. So now we know it's a hypothesis problem. So now we're gonna do it in four steps. Every time you do a hypothesis test, you're gonna do it in four steps. Form the hypothesis. We're going to write down uh, what the king and peasant's claims are. So we're going to write down H0, write down H1. And we'll write down a little bit more after. Next thing is we have to figure out what letter are they fighting over. Now I know they're fighting over percentages, so P, because that's all the problems in section 10.2. But on the exam, you know, the, you're going to have to go, okay, what, what letter are they fighting over in this problem? What letter are they fighting over in this problem? So how do we know it's a percentage problem? Well, a little bit of a hint is we see a percentage. That helps a little bit. Um, let's see here, do they say that? No, sometimes they'll use the word proportion. They don't do it in this problem, but if they use the word proportion, that means percentage, okay? But the dead giveaway, as far as I'm concerned, to know it's a percentage problem, is if there's a yes or no question going on. So if your data is yeses and nos, it's gonna be a percentage problem. So it says they talked to 47 students and asked if they have a job. So the question is, do you have a job? What's the answer gonna be? Yes or no? It's not gonna be 29, right? Like if I ask you for your age, you give me a number like 29. But if I say, do you have a job? You're gonna say yes or no. It's a yes or no question. So it's a percentage problem. So I'm gonna put a P here. Oops. So you put a P right here. Also right here. Okay, next, the king's claim will always have an equal sign. So we'll put an equal sign here. All right, and then what number are we gonna put over here? 50%. 50%, right. Whatever number you put there, you're gonna put that same number here. And don't forget the peasant's claim is gonna be a less than, a greater than, or a not equal to. Which one do you think goes there? Greater than? Yeah. It says test the claim that more than 50%, greater than 50% of Rio students have a job. So right here, this claim this is the peasant's claim and the king's claim will always have an equal sign. So that's the king's claim. Uh, okay, let me mention one more thing before we go on. We saw this happen last class. And if you looked at example one and example three, I think it happens in both of those examples, but it didn't happen in this one. Every stats question is about a population, but sometimes they'll mention two populations in the question, but the question's only about one of them, okay? And when that happens, the only reason they mention the other population is so they can give you the number to use in your test over here. But in this problem, there's only one population. The population is just all Riojano students. Thank you.
Okay, so there's H0 and H1. Then you, anytime you use a symbol in your hypothesis, test, you have to write down what the symbol stands for. So write down what P is. Whenever you're describing a percentage in words, you always do it in three parts. First thing you can write is the percentage of, okay, so this part is you're saying percentage. Then you gotta mention the population. The population is all real Hondo students, all real Hondo students. That's the population. And then the thir third part is you have to mention the portion, the part of the population that say yes to your question. Who are the ones who are gonna say yes to the question? The ones that have a job. So the percentage of all real Honda students that have a job. So, okay, every time you describe a percentage, it's in those three, three parts. The percentage of, and then percentages describe, compare the size of two groups. So you now have to mention what the two groups are. So that the groups are gonna be the entire population and then the part of the population that say yes to your question. Okay, that's the hypothesis test part. Any questions on that part? Okay, so then the next part's gonna be the test statistic part. Last class, this would have been the third step, but we're doing p-value method right now, okay? And if you do p-value method, the test statistic becomes the second part. The rejection region, which would have been the second part was like a picture. The p-value is also gonna be like a picture, slightly different, but that picture is gonna come after the test statistic. So test statistic is second, p-value is third, and then the fourth one's gonna be the conclusion, fourth part. For the test statistic part, we gotta plug into the test statistic formula. Let me go ahead and write it down. Here's the test statistic formula for this section. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write down all the things I need in order to plug into this formula. What do I need? I need the sample size n, I need X and I need P hat. N is the sample size. What's N in this problem? 47. 47. Yeah. Now X, uh, when you're doing percentage problems, X stands for how many of these people said yes to the question. So how many people said yes? 31. 31. And then p hat, there's a formula for it, not that we need it, but you find a percentage, number of people that said yes goes on top, number of people in your sample total goes on the bottom. And then you plug all this into the test statistic formula. This is an ugly decimal, so when that happens, I advise you to just leave it as a fraction, because when you leave it as a fraction, it's unrounded. And then you just type it in, you just put it into this formula, p hat minus p over square root of p over n. Okay, there's a couple of tricky things with this formula. So let's see. P hat is 31 over 47 minus P. This is the king's claim of P, which is over here, 50%. So you're going to put 50%, put it as a decimal. And now the bottom. Right here, I have to put P. What goes in this first parentheses? 150. 0.50, that's right. Make sure you guys are clear on that, okay? A lot of times people will put 31 over 47. They'll put the P hat, but it's not P hat right here. It's just P, okay? So you just put P there. And then Q is uh, one minus that. That's also 0.50. Okay, so I'm getting this 0.50 by doing one minus this number here. Okay, and then N is 47. And then we're gonna type this in the calculator. So now the next tricky thing is typing it in the calculator. So if you have your calculator out, do this with me real quick. So we'll type this part first, 31 divided by 47 minus 0. 0.50. And on my calculator, the answer to the circled part is 0. 0.1595 something or other, 0. 0.159 something, okay? Then you push divide for this line here, treat as a divide. Then you open a square root, and now don't type in anything else yet. You open the square root, and now check this out. If your calculator is an older calculator, when you open the root on your calculator right next to the root symbol, you'll see a parentheses. So if your calculator is one of those where you see a parentheses, like mine has a parentheses right now in front of it. If yours does that, then you gotta be careful, because if you close this parentheses, the root is over. Okay, 
So you don't want to close the parentheses until you've typed everything in here, in it. So this is what I like to do in that situation. You see one parentheses open, I like to open some more. I just open a few more. The open parentheses button is above the number eight. So right above the number eight, it says open parentheses. I just push it a few times. And then I type all this in, 0 0.50 times 0 0.50 divided by 47 and get the answer. If you don't open any parentheses, and if, if you type in, you know, you're probably gonna type in 0 0.50, then you're probably gonna close the parentheses because you see the close parentheses here. As soon as you close this parentheses, the rest of this stuff is not in the root and you've messed up everything. Okay, so if there's a big mess in a root, my advice to you is open some more parentheses. Now, if you have one of those calculators where it's a newer one and when you open the root, you just end up with like a box inside the root, then just make sure you type everything you type in there is inside the root and you should be okay. The answer that I have for this is 2.18797.4872. So if you got that, you typed it in right. Any questions on the test statistic part? All right, let's go ahead to the third part. The third part is the p-value part. Kind of like the rejection region, you're gonna write down alpha if it's given to you, which is 0.03. You would write degrees of freedom, but there's no degrees of freedom in this section because we're doing percentage problems we're using z-table that doesn't need degrees of freedom. So you just write down uh, 0.03 and then you draw a picture. This is the Z distribution that I'm drawing. Okay, now the way you find the p-value is you put the test statistic in the picture. Here's the test statistic. I'm gonna put this in the picture. It's positive, so it's on the right side. So here's the picture on the right side. So I'm gonna put a tick mark and I'm gonna label it 2.18797.4872. Don't round this number at all. Okay, so write that whole number there. Sometimes when you're doing the p-value, <clears throat> you have to put two numbers in the picture. Sometimes you only put one. If it's a two-tail test, you have to put two numbers in the picture. But this problem is a one-tail test, right? It's only a greater than, it's a one-tail. So you just put the one number in the picture, just the test statistic. Then you go up to the curve and you shade to the right. Why am I shading to the right? Because this is a right-tail test. Because again, because H1 is a greater than. So back over here, because, because this is a greater than, it's a right tail test, so you shade to the right. And that's the picture for the p-value. Just so you know, most of the time when I'm grading, uh, the p-value is usually worth three points. Not always, but most of the time it's worth three points. And it's worth three points because I look for three things. So first I'm looking for the picture. So this would be one point if we draw this picture. Then the second thing is I want the notation for the area, and then I want the answer, right, for the p-value. So the second thing is the notation. So we're going to go over here and write the notation here. We've done this before, back in section 7.2, when we were doing areas under normal distributions. I wanna write, so we, I like, it would give you a picture and I would ask, what's the notation? So same thing here, what's the notation? This area, I wanna write the notation for it. It's the probability of something. Probability of what, can you tell me? So it's the area to the right of 2.18, whatever. How do you write that? Probability what? Z greater than 2.18797472. Yeah. Z greater than this. Okay, so we did that stuff back in section 7.4. Um, it's greater than because we're shading to the right. It's Z because it's Z distribution. If you were gonna do this for the T distribution like last class, then you'd put a T here instead of a Z. You put whatever the variable is. But anyway, for today it's Z. Okay, so that would be two points there. Picture, one point, notation, one point. And then now we gotta calculate it on the calculator. And so let me show you how to calculate it. Cool. So now I'll pull out the calculator. We're looking for an area under the Z distribution. So I gotta tell the calculator, find an area under the Z distribution. The way you do that, there's this thing right here, it says distribution, it says it in blue, okay? So you gotta say Z, we gotta find the Z distribution because it's in blue, you're gonna push second. Second, 
distribution. You're pushing this vars button, but it says distribution above there. And then we have to pick one of these. Which one are we going to pick? You're going to use the second one, normal CDF. Think of normal as like Z distribution, okay? But there's a normal PDF and a normal CDF. We're never going to use PDF ever. I'm not even going to explain what that is, but we're going to use normal CDF, okay? So if you want to find the area under the Z distribution, you can use normal CDF. So one more time, second distribution, go to normal CDF, push enter. Now, if you have a newer calculator, then it's going to display it like this. And I'll explain what to do if your calculator is a little bit older in a minute, but, but still watch what I'm doing here. So what you have to do now is you have to tell the calculator where the area starts and where the area ends. What I mean by that is look at this area over here. There's a left edge of the area right here where this line is, and then there's the right edge. The left side of the area is the number 2.18 whatever. That's where the area starts. That's the left side of where the shading starts. The shading goes to the right forever. So there's no right end. There's no right edge. So the right edge is infinity. Okay. So it's like we're telling the calculator, find the area from the number 2.18 to infinity. Find the area under the curve. Okay. So the lower is going to be the left edge of the area. You're going to type 2.18. Oops. 2.18797 and then for the upper, you have to type positive infinity. Now there's no positive infinity button on the calculator. So uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, the way I'm gonna show you how to do it is I just type a really big positive number. So I just, that's, I type what's already there. I type a bunch of nines, nine, 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 nine. Usually I type like five nines, just a super big number. Okay, that's like positive infinity. But one more time, so the, you have to type the, since I want to find this area, you have to tell the calculator the left edge of the area first and then the right edge. Left edge is 2.18, whatever. The right edge is infinity. So from so the lower is the left edge, the upper is the right edge. Now these two should say 0, 1 on your calculator. If they don't say 0, 1, type 0, 1. But by default, they usually say 0, 1. You push enter there. Now, if your calculator doesn't display lower upper, then it's going to look like this. It's going to say normal CDF. Then you got to type in the left edge first, 2.18, whatever, comma. The comma button is right above the number seven on your calculator. So you got to put the comma in yourself. And then you'll type in positive infinity, which is 99999. You can type a bigger number than that if you want. And you don't have to type the zero and the one like it says here. Okay, you can type it if you want. But the reason it's zero, one is because for Z distribution, the mean is zero, standard deviation is one. But if you don't type it in, the calculator will automatically assume that you wanted zero one there. And then that's it, you push enter and there's the uh, P value. There's the area that's in black over here. 0 0.0143, I guess I'll round it to 0 0.0143. Any questions on finding the P value? All right. Um, professor, and this is under distri distribution, right? Right. Second distribution, normal CDF. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. So there's the p-value, 0 0.0143. Then after you find the p-value, you always want to ask yourself this question. Is the p-value less than alpha? That's always the question you want to know. The p-value is 0 0.0143. And alpha is over here, 0 0.03. Is 0 0.0143 less than 0 0.03, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's 0 0.01 something that's less than 0 0.03 something, yes. So then we can write down the conclusion, which is our fourth step. If the answer is yes, the conclusion is reject 8.0. Remember, if the p-value is less than alpha, you reject H0. So always ask this question. If the answer is yes, you reject H0. If the answer is no, you do not reject H0. And then we'll write the answer in words. Any questions so far? Okay, to write the answer in words, reject H0, what does that mean? That means we're not believing this. We are believing this. Evidence suggests this. Okay, so I want to say evidence suggests and then write down what H1 is. But instead of writing P, I'm going to write it in words. I'm going to write, evidence suggests the percentage of all real honor students that have a job is more than 50%. Evidence suggests the 
at um here let me write a little bit shorter that more than 50 percent of all rio hondo students have a job that saved me like two words writing it that way all right any questions Okay, that's how you do the p-value method. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the problem, the rejection region method. Uh, on quizzes and exams, I usually tell you which way to do it, okay? So just do it the way I tell you to do it. If you ever get a problem where I don't tell you which way to do it, then you can pick the way you like, but otherwise just do it the way I tell you to do it. So let's do, the, this is saying do the, use the rejection region method. So I'm just gonna go through the four steps, but I'm not gonna redo steps that I've already done. So the first step would be, to write the hypothesis test down. We already did that, so I'm not gonna do that part now. The second step would be to figure out what the rejection region is. That we haven't done, so let's go ahead and do that. Just like the p-value part, the rejection region part is a picture. You're gonna write down alpha is 0.03. If one is given, you write down the alpha. If you need degrees of freedom, you write it down, but we don't need it, so we're not gonna write it down. Then you draw a picture of the z distribution. This is z distribution again. What side is the rejection region on? The right. Yeah, just to remind you, H1 is a greater than, so the rejection region is on the right side. So you put a tick mark on the right, you go up to the curve, you shade to the right, and you label the area with the alpha, the alpha is 0.03, and then you look up this number in the Z table. So for rejection region method, you first write down what the area is, and then you look up the number in the Z table. Now you can't look up this number in the Z table the way it is because we know the area to the right. And the way Z table works, you need to know the area to the left in order to look it up. So I first have to figure out the area of the stuff that's not shaded, which is one minus 0.03. So you look for 0.97 in the middle. That's the way it works. So you have to know the area to the left uh, and then the air, remember the way Z table works, areas are in the middle and we're gonna use the positive side of the Z table because it's a positive number that I'm looking for. So here, here's the Z table, the positive side, see it's all positives here. We're looking for 0.97 in the middle. If it's not there, we'll pick the closest one. Uh, let's see, okay, I see 0.9699 and 0 0.9706. 0 0.97 is between those. But 0.9699 is much closer. That's only one away. 0.9706 is six away. It's further, so we're not going to use that one. So we'll use the 0.9699. Then you go like this. And the number is 1.88. So this number down here, 1.88. Any questions on the rejection region part? Okay. The third part would be the test statistic part. We already did it, so I'm not gonna do it again. But let me just remind you what it was. Let me remind me what it was. What was it? Uh, 2.18, yeah. 2.18797.872. Okay. And then you wanna see where this number lands in the picture. It's bigger than 1.88, so it's in the red region. So it's in the rejection region. When you land in the rejection region, and the conclusion is reject eight zero. And you have to write in words, but we already did that, so I'm not gonna do that again. So that's how you do the rejection region method. Any questions on that? Okay, one thing I do wanna point out because the rejection region method picture and the p-value method picture look the same. So let me just make sure it's clear here. They're both right tail. You're shading a right tail for both of them. But here's the p-value picture. I wanna make sure you understand what the difference is. For the p-value picture, you label the bottom number first. So you do this first, and then you find the area second. Okay, so you label the bottom number and then you find the area using the calculator. Whereas when it comes to rejection region method, you label the area first, and then you find the number on the bottom second by using the table or whatever. So it's backwards, okay? So if again, for p-value, you label a number on the bottom first, 
there's the, let me go back to that slide. So again, you label a number on the bottom first, and then you find an area second on the calculator. Uh, so you label the bottom number with the test statistic, then you find the area with the calculator. Uh, whereas for p-value, you label the, the area is the alpha, so you label the area first, and then you look up the number on the bottom with the table. Okay, so they are different pictures, but they are similar. All right, one last thing, and then we'll be done with this example. So let's go to part C. It says, what is the meaning of the 0.03 significance level? There's nothing different between what it says in this question and what it what, what it said last class. You need to say, if you run the same hypothesis many times, you'll make a type one error about 3% of the time. This is the right way to write it. So you can write, if you uh, run the same hypothesis test, many times, each time with a new sample, that's basically saying you're going to run the same hypothesis over and over again. Then you're going to say you're going to, you're going to make a type one error, but don't write type one error, write what a type one error is. Here's what it is. You will reject H0 when H0 is true. That's like you're gonna send the king to jail when he wasn't supposed to go to jail. Um, that's a, So that line there is a type one error. Then you write about, and they just change this to a percent, about 3% of the time. Okay, so it, there's no difference between this question being asked in 10.2 and this question being asked in 10.3. Okay, any questions on example two? Let's do example three, and then we'll call it for the day. Let's see what it says. In December 2001, 30% of adults with children under the age of 18 reported that their family ate dinner together seven nights a week. In a recent poll, 403 of 1,122 adults with children under the age of 18 reported that their family ate dinner together seven nights a week. Has the proportion of families with children under the age of 18 who eat dinner together seven nights a week decreased? And then again, it says use the PVI method, then the rejection region method, and then explain the meaning uh, of the 0.08 significance level. Um, so again, because we're just learning PVI method today, I'm going to do the PVI method first. But you know, they're equally important. Make sure you know how to do both methods. Um, and especially if I put two problems on a quiz, I'll usually tell you to do one one way and one the other way. But okay. So again, first things first. How can we tell this is a hypothesis test? Um, it says test the claim. Okay, that's good. P-value method, you only hear when you hear hypothesis test. It's a significance level. These are all big hints that it's hypothesis test. So that's the first thing. Be able to recognize that it's hypothesis test because most of the time, they don't write hypothesis test in the problem. Sometimes they do, but most of the time they don't. But again, even if they say test something, that's usually pretty good. Okay. After we know it's hypothesis test, we're gonna do the p-value method and we're gonna do it in four steps. First step, we're gonna write down the hypothesis test. We're gonna write down what the argument is. All right. Um, so the next thing now is to figure out what letter they're fighting over. Again, I know they're fighting over P because that's what we're learning today, but how can we tell? Here it says, has the proportion of families, whatever decreased, proportion means percentage. Okay, we also see a percentage over here. So, okay, so that helps. Um, and if you don't, if that's not enough, uh, you know, find a yes or no question that'll guarantee that it's a percentage problem. It says 38% of adults with children in high school. No, uh, sorry, I, okay. 38% of adults with children under the age of 18 reported their family ate dinner together seven nights a week. So what would you do when you poll? Okay, let's read the next one. In a poll, 403 of 120... 1,122 adults with children under the age of 18 reported their family ate dinner seven nights a week. So the question would be, you find an adult who has a child under the age of 18, and you would ask them, do you guys eat dinner together seven nights a week? So it's a yes or no question. Yes, we do. No, we don't. So yes or no question, dead giveaway that it's a percentage problem. So we're going to put P here. Oops. Okay, so... They're fighting over P, so we'll put P here. All right. Then, remember the king's claim always has an equal sign, so we put an equal sign over here. 
Now, uh, this problem, uh, like a lot of the ones that we've done in the past, they mentioned two populations. So one population, let me write down what they are. One population is all adults with children under 18, meaning I think what they mean, it's a little bit unclear. Sometimes people are unclear, but that's how the world works, right? People are just not as clear as they could be. That's why, you know, that's one thing you should work on when you're in college is try to be a little bit clearer than you could be. But even the problems are not really clear. What I think they mean is adults where all of their children are under 18. I think that's what they mean. So, it's, so if they have three children, they're all under 18. All adults with children under 18 um, in December... 2001. That's one population. The other population is all adults with children under 18 now. Because there, because there's the question is, has the proportion of families has it decreased since then, since 2001? So what is it now, and is it, is it has it gone down then from what it was before? So two populations are mentioned in this question, but this question is only about one of them. Even though the question is about one of them, they mention two of them. Which um, which of these two populations is the population that's in the question? Someone tell me. Is it the ones from the people from 2001 or the people now? now yeah it's the people now they're asking the question look they're asking you a question and you have to answer you have to set up your test to answer the question has the proportion decreased since 2001 so like what is it now and is it smaller so we're talking about now so since the population is these people now why are they mentioning these other people back in 2001 because they want to give you a percentage. They're giving you, they're trying to hand you this 38% and also explain at the same time where it came from. So back into December, 2001, the percentage of people of adults where all their children are under 18, the percentage of them that ate dinner uh, together seven nights a week was 38%. No one's arguing over that. That's a population parameter, but it's known, no one's arguing over it. But the population we care about is, the percentage we care about is the percentage of all adults who eat dinner together seven nights a week now. We don't know what that is. That's what these are, okay? And the king is gonna say, it's the same as it was back then, okay? So they're trying to hand you the 38% to put in your tests. So this is gonna be 38% right here, okay? But again, when you see the top proportion, that when you see the top sentence there, don't think of this as the percentage of people in 2001 was 38%. Okay, because then why would it show up in my test when they're not arguing over that? Both of these P's are about now, the percentage of adults now who eat dinner or whatever. And the king is saying it's 38% like it was back in December 2001. And the peasant's going to say, no, it's not. It's something else. Okay, so that's that. All right, so that's the 38% over there. This is going to be 38% as well. And now we got to figure out, is this a less than, a greater than, or a not equal to? So what symbol goes there? Less than, greater than, or not equal to? Less than. Less than, yes. Because it asks, has the proportion decreased? So less than. Okay, so the last example was a greater than. This example is going to be a less than. Make sure you guys watch the lecture that I gave the other class, the example one part of it, so you can see how to do a not equal to because it's a little bit different. Okay, so make sure you watch that. But we're going to do the other ones in here. Okay. You also have to write down what P stands for. It's a percentage. Whenever you write a percentage down, you can write it in three steps. First, you're going to write the percentage of, so that's the where you write the percentage part. And now I'm going to write down um, the population, the percentage of all adults with children. under 18, okay, that part is the population. Um, let's see, how did they write it over here? So 
So now the last part's gonna be the part of the population that say yes. You're gonna ask, do you eat dinner seven nights a week together? And so who are gonna be the ones that say yes? The ones that do eat dinner together seven nights a week. The percentage of all adults with children under 18 whose families eat dinner together. Seven nights a week. Okay, so that's how you describe the percentage. You're getting three parts. Percentage, population, the part of the population that will say yes to your question. All right, that's the first part. Any questions on the hypothesis test part? Oh, I got, I have a mistake. Sorry, sorry. All adults with children under 18 now. That was very important that I left that off. I shouldn't have left that off. Make sure you put now because in this problem, again, they talk about two populations, and but the problem is only about one of them. So you want to make it clear. So it's all the adults, all of them now, all of them who have children under 18 now, and they all eat dinner seven nights a week. Okay, now I'm done with the hypothesis part. Any questions on the hypothesis part? Okay, so then the second step, since we're doing p-value method, second step is the test statistic. You always have to find the test statistic before you can find the p-value. So you're gonna write down what n is and what x is and what p-hat is, and then you'll plug into the test statistic formula. n is your sample size, what is it? What's n? 1,122. Okay. And then X is how many of them said yes to the question. How many said yes, we eat dinner together seven nights a week. How many is that? 403. Yeah. And then to find the percentage of them that eat dinner seven nights a week, you divide the numbers, make sure you put the, the bigger, the smaller one on top. So 403 said yes out of 1122 total. I'm guessing that's probably an ugly number. So I'm going to probably leave it as a fraction. Let me just check on my calculator. Yeah, it's just a long decimal. So when it's a long decimal, just leave it as a fraction so you don't do any rounding. Okay, then we're gonna plug into the test statistic formula, which is p hat minus p over square root of pq over n. Okay, p hat is this. I'm just gonna write it just like that, 403 over 1122 minus p is the king's claim of p. So it's over here, 38%. And then on the bottom, this square root, what do I write in this parentheses right here? Right here. 38. 0. 0.38. Yeah, you got to write P there. So 0. 0.38. Don't put the fraction. Don't put P hat. So that's 0. 0.38. And then Q, you got to do 1 minus the 0. 0.38 to get Q. Someone tell me what to put for Q. B62. 0.62. Yeah, you do one minus the 0.38 and you get the 0.62. And then divide by N, which is 1122. And now we gotta type this in the calculator. Once again, let's do it together, make sure we get the right answer. So first you're gonna type in the top, 403 divided by 1122 minus 0.38, get the answer. On my calculator, I'm getting for the circled part up there, negative 0 0.0208, some other stuff, okay? 0 0.0208, negative 0 0.0208. Then you divide, that takes care of that. Then you open the root, so square root. And again, my advice to you, if your root on your calculator, if a parenthesis shows up, open more parentheses. So on my calculator, I'm opening a few more parentheses before I type any of that stuff in there. So now I'm typing 0 0.38 times 0 0.62 divided by 11.22. And the answer I have, negative 1.43. 677-5014. All right, that's the test statistic. Any questions? So if you're not doing it right now in your calculator, make sure you do it at some point before the next quiz because again, this is one place where people get tripped up. And if you get the wrong test statistic, you're gonna get the wrong p-value because it depends on the p-value. So make sure you're able to get that number. So last chance, any questions on the test statistic? 
Okay, next part is the p-value part. It's our third step. You can write down alpha if one is given to you. It is, it's 0 0.08. We're not going to do a problem where alpha is not given to you for a while. So anyway, 0 0.08, no degrees of freedom. Otherwise, you would write the degrees of freedom here. But again, it's Z distribution. Z distribution doesn't have degrees of freedom, so you don't write it. So you draw a Z distribution. Now, when it comes to p-value method, you have to first label a number on the bottom with your test statistic. The test statistic is negative 1.43 number. It's negative, it's on this side. So I'll put it there somewhere, negative 1.43. Uh, I, forgot, I forgot what it was, let me see. 677, 014. Okay, now sometimes again, you have to put two numbers in your picture, sometimes only one. We only have to put this one because it's a one tail test. If it was a two tail test, again, like example one, then you'd have to put a second number in the picture. So then you go from there up to the curve and you're gonna show you to the left why it's a left tail test. See, H1 is a less than. So when H1 is a less than, it's a left tail test. So you go from there up to the curve, shade to the left. The area I just shaded is the p-value. So again, when I grade the p-value, I look for three things. First, I look for the picture then the notation, then the answer. So there's the picture. Any questions on the picture? Okay, then we need the notation for it. Okay, someone tell me the notation for the p-value. Is it like the, uh, the probability of uh, like comma Z? Not comma, but Z, keep going. Sorry, not comma, yeah, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> Finish it. Um, what is it? Z is uh, less than, uh, was it negative 1.4 in the rest of the numbers? Exactly, yeah. Uh-oh. Okay, so there's the notation. It's the area to the left. When, you draw, when you're writing area to the left, it's Z less than. It's Z because it's Z distribution. Had this been a T distribution or something else, you would have put a T there instead of a Z, but it's Z distribution, so you put Z. Okay, so there's the notation. Now we gotta get the calculator to calculate it for us. So let me go ahead and pull out the calculator here. Okay, so we're trying to find an area, p-value is an area, we're trying to find the area under the z distribution. So the way you do that is you first find the z distribution. So again, that's in blue over here, right above the vars button. So you're gonna push second distribution and you're gonna go to normal CDF. When it's z distribution you're using, go to normal CDF, do not use normal PDF, enter. Now, you gotta tell the calculator, take a look at the area. Okay, there it is over there. You gotta tell the calculator, where the area starts and where the area ends. In other words, what's the left edge of the area and what's the right edge of the area? The right side of the area is this line over here at negative 1.43, whatever. That's the right edge. The left edge, well, the area goes to the left forever. So the left edge, you're gonna write negative infinity. When you go to the left, it's those are the negative numbers. So you can put negative infinity. So you have to first tell it the left edge, that's the lower, then the right edge, which is the upper. So negative infinity goes for the left edge. So the way you type that, everyone check this out, okay? When you're typing a negative, make sure you type, push this button. Don't push the subtraction button when you're trying to type a negative, it's gonna give you an error. So negative right here, a big number. So that's like negative infinity. That's the left edge of the area, okay? Again, that's because the area goes to the left forever. Then the right edge is this negative 1.43 number. Again, make sure you type this negative here, negative, 1.43, I forgot the rest, let me go see what it was, 43, 677, okay, 6775014, okay. Okay, and then again, if your calculator looks like this, make sure that you say 01, push enter. If your calculator doesn't look like that, then it'll look like this, it'll say normal CDF, 
And again, you have to type the left edge of the area and then the right edge. Left edge is negative 99999. Then comma, you have to make sure you put the comma. The comma is above the seven. And then the right edge, which is the negative 1.43 number. So again, left edge, negative 999, right edge, negative 1.43, whatever. And then push enter. You do not have to type the zero and one that show up on my calculator, but if you type it, it's fine. But if you don't type in the zero one, it's gonna automatically assume Z distribution zero one. And you push enter and that's the p-value. Any questions on obtaining this p-value? Okay, so it's 0 0.0754, let's say 0 0.0754. Okay, let's go back to this. So don't round until you get there, but once you get there, you can go ahead and round a little bit. 0 0.0754. You don't want to round too much, okay? So if you're not sure if you should round or not, write more digits, it's always better. Because what's gonna happen here, okay? We're gonna now compare the p-value to the alpha, okay? And look how close it is. Point, our p-value is 0 0.07 something, and our alpha is 0.08, they're pretty close together. When they're close like that, if you round, you might get the wrong answer. You might all of a sudden think we're on the other side when we're not, okay? If you round this to 0 0.08, then which side of alpha are we on? You don't even know. If you round this to 0 0.1, then you're going to say, do not reject 8.0 when we are supposed to reject 8.0. So that's why I don't want you rounding at all until you get to the p-value. And even on the p-value, if it's close to alpha, you shouldn't round it. But right here, the rounding is not a problem here. It's like I, I went to four numbers after the decimal, and I'll be able to know um, I'll be able to compare it to this. If I, the alphas, when they give you an alpha, they always go to two numbers after the decimal. So if you always go to four when you're rounding in your final answer, you'll be okay. But again, don't round this because if you round this, then this will be different and it'll be wrong, okay? And you may end up with the wrong conclusion. That's the main reason you have to be careful about rounding. All right, then you have to ask yourself, is the p-value less than alpha? always the question you ask yourself after you have the p-value. So the p-value is 0 0.0754 and the alpha is 0 0.08. Is 0 0.0754 less than 0 0.08, yes or no? Point oh seven five four less than 0 0.08, yes or no? Yes. Yes. 0 0.07 is less than 0 0.08. Conclusion, when the answer is yes, the conclusion is reject H0. If the answer would have been no, you would write do not reject H0. Okay, now we gotta write the answer in words, reject H0, let's go back to the H0 and H1. If we're rejecting H0, then in our minds, we're not believing this, we're siding with this. So the percentage has decreased, okay? Uh, there's a couple ways to write it. You can write evidence suggests, and then you can write this down, but instead of writing P, you can write P in words. You could write evidence suggests a percentage of all adults with children and under 18 now whose families eat dinner together seven nights a week is less than 38%. It's a lot of words. You can write it that way if you want. Or you can just say the proportion of families with children under 18 who eat dinner together has decreased because that's the question they ask. That's still kind of a lot of words. So either way, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of words. But the part that I've underlined there, it has, we are believing that it's decreased. So, okay. Um, evidence suggests that the, I'm just going to basically copy this down, that the proportion of families with children under 18 who eat dinner together seven nights a week decreased. Oops. You can say less than 38%. There's a lot of ways you can say it, but I'll just say it that way. And that's how you do example three using the p-value method. Any questions?
Okay, let's go ahead and do the problem over using the rejection region method now. And again, I'm not going to do the parts I've already done, but if you're going to do the rejection region method, the very first thing you do is you write down the hypothesis tests, which we already did, so I'm, I'm not going to do that one over. The second step is the rejection region. We didn't do that yet, so I'll go ahead and do that. So alpha is 0.08. There's no degrees of freedom to write down, so you just go ahead and draw a picture now. This is the Z distribution. Okay, now again, for rejection region, you have to label an area first. What side is the rejection region on, the left side or the right side? Let's go back here, take a look at this. Is the rejection region on the left side or right side? Uh, left side. Left side, because it's less than. So you're gonna put a tick mark on the left side, go up to the curve and shade to the left, but you label the area first. For p-value method, you would label the bottom number first, but for rejection region method, you label the area first. The area is 0.08. And then you look this number up on the table. And that's a really easy number to look up this time because for a Z table, you need to know the area to the left of the number in order to look it up. And I know the area to the left of this line is 0.08. So you can look it up. And the number is going to be negative, so we're going to use the negative side of the Z table. So get the negative side of the Z table out and look for 0.08 in the middle. Here's the negative side of the Z table. I'm looking for point. Remember, areas are in the middle. We're looking for 0.08. And I'm seeing 0.0808 and 0.0793. 0.0793 is just a little bit closer than 0 0.0808. 0 0.0793 is seven away from 0 0.08. 0 0.0808 is eight away. So we're not gonna be using this one. We're gonna use the 0.793. And the answer, you go on the edge, it's 1.41. Negative 1.41 is what it is. So this number here, negative 1.41. Okay, questions on the rejection region part. Okay, the third part is the test statistic part, which we already did. So I'm not gonna do that again, but let me just write down what the answer was. I'm gonna go back and find what it was. This negative 1.43 number. Negative 1.43677514. And now you wanna see where this number lands in the picture. And again, look how close it is to this cutoff number. When things are close, that's the main reason you don't wanna round, okay? because if you round, like, okay, where is this number? Negative 1.43 is just barely in the red region. But if you round, you might accidentally think that you're not in the red region and that causes a problem. But anyway, we are in the red region because negative 1.43 is a little to the left of negative 1.41. So we are in the red region. And when you land in the red region, that means the conclusion is Jack eight zero. And then of course, you would have to write it in words, but we did that already, so I'm not going to do that again. And that's how you would do the problem if you're doing the rejection region method. You would just show all these steps, but again, since I already did them, I'm not going to do them over. That's example three. Any questions on example three? All right, so that's going to be the end of the story for today, guys.